The purpose of this presentation is to unpick clips of my coaching and develop an understanding of when and how to use the constraints-led approach. This is one aspect of my coaching ability that I struggle to incorporate into sessions and therefore the players do not gain the required outcome. I will unpick positives and negatives of when I try to incorporate constraints into my coaching and will begin to understand when and how to use this approach within non-linear coaching. Hanford et al. 1997 believes that an ideal method of encouraging exploratory behaviour during practice and simultaneously assisting the learner to differentiate between specifying and non-specifying va variables is to use a constraints-led approach. By manipulating specific task, environmental or organismic constraints, the practitioner can shape and guide the coordination patterns that emerge as the learner attempts to perform particular movement solutions to satisfy goals. In this following clip, the players are participating in a passing drill. They have no pressure apart from watching other players on the pitch so they don't bang into them. When each player gets the ball, I ask them to conduct a skill called a V-drag. This is a skill that is usually used to get out of contact from a defender. Renshaw et al. 2010 backs the previous statement and states it is likely that the addition of defenders allow players to contextualise their disposals and to choose an appropriate decision based upon realistic perceptual variables. After unpicking this clip, I realised that the players are conducting a V-drag but without the contest of a defender. In a match-like situation, the players will not be able to visualise and use this skill as they cannot put the skill into a game. Allowed to tell 1980 believes an important consideration in the development of skill performance is the interaction between the task and the performer. When a player undergoes a task that is not an accurate representation of the typical performance setting, or when a task contains insufficient level of variability, expert performance can deteriorate to the level of novices. Looking back, I should have manipulated the key task constraint by including defenders. Renshaw et al. 2010 also believes the addition of opponents would have had a marked influence on the playing environment as this would have differentially affected the solutions that emerged from this drill. Therefore, the players would be able to link a skill into match play. Furthermore, Williams and Hodges 2004 believes task constraints are significant because coaches and teachers can manipulate them to help learners search for functional and individualised coordination solutions. Thus, overall, this drill did not allow the learner to understand and coordinate functional movement patterns because there was no beneficial constraint incorporated. In the same drill, I did try to incorporate the constraints-led approach by making the area smaller. This was to try and promote quicker decision making as I had less space to conduct a rollout or a V-drag. Again, I did not incorporate defenders, so realistically they would not conduct this skill unless they were in a match being put under pressure from a defender. A positive outcome that was obvious was that the players started to look up and to see where they were running and passing. Moreover, there was more negative than positive. Again, the players still were just conducting a V-drag just because I told them to, and the area I made was not small enough as they still had acres of space. McGarry et al. 2013 believes a significant challenge inherent to experimental design is to develop task constraints that are representative of specific skills, drills and environments. Hanford has suggested that a very important question is when do performers need stability and when do they need variability? From a pedagogical viewpoint, Hanford's question can be viewed in two perspectives. Hanford's concerns were more focused on the first perspective when he suggested that, despite the stability needed to produce a specific movement pattern, some elements should be left free to vary in order to satisfy immediate task demands. In this constraint, I did not allow variability from the performers. In a match situation, the players may not need to use a V-drag and can use other techniques through dynamical systems and self-organisation. I may have been trying to give them too much stability and not enough variability. Williams et al. 1995 states, Motor system degrees of freedom have neurobiological capacity to self-organise. It can adjust as task constraints change. 
Through these inherent processes of movement systems, the interacting constraints of the individual, environment and task can lead to spontaneous but still coordinated formation of movement patterns. This drill had four goals, each at the corner of the playing area. Both teams had to score in the opposite goal. This proved to be a successful task constraint. The team I was coaching have a tendency to follow the ball. Using the four goals, I tried to enable them to spread out and have four points of goal direction. As you can see, they have self-organised as they have realised there are four points of scoring. When Chartal 2010 backs me up by suggesting the interactions of this constraint force the learner to seek a stable and effective movement pattern during goal-directed activity. As stated earlier, the self-organisation process is underway. This is shown when players understood they will have more chance of scoring if they use the space and any all goal. After acknowledging that the team I coach have a tendency to ball follow, I was able to develop a successful task constraint. McMorris and Hale 2006 believes manipulation of a task constraint requires coaches to possess a mastery of knowledge and understanding in specific sport to lead learners towards discovering functional coordination patterns and decision making through self-organisation. Coaches are well placed to make such small but important changes to learning environments, leading to large scale changes in movement patterns during motor learning. Furthermore, Newell's 1986 constraints model provides an excellent conceptualisation to guide physical education because it captures the range of diverse constraints acting on learners. Chai and Chain 2010 talk about the constraints model and how it provides a strong theoretical foundation for explaining the emergence of behaviour in motor learning development. The different categories of constraints present in learning and teaching situations set as boundaries from which learners can develop specific goal-directed behaviours in various task constraints. Thus, the emergence of movement coordination in learners occurs within an embodied framework where the performer, task and the environment play a significant role in shaping the development of movement outcomes. In this next clip, I moved the last drill onto another constraint. This is because I noticed that once the player scored, they wouldn't want to change direction. They'd automatically go for the same goal that is congested with players when another goal may be open that would be more beneficial to aim for. I still have four goals, but now I've incorporated a box in the middle of the pitch. Only one person from each team are allowed in the box at any one time. The ball then has to go through the box before a goal can be scored. The logic of this is that by bringing the ball back into the middle, they may begin to self-organise and facilitate the space around them. In this drill, I was trying to incorporate a conditioned game, as the earlier drills did not include variability of skill selection and self-organisation. Nash then goes on to say, conditioned games use task, environmental and organismic constraints which will develop the learner's ability to recognise affordances and develop his or her own self-organised movement skills. Looking back, I tried to incorporate a conditioned game, but I did not incorporate all aspects of Newell's model. Nash believes I should not only have just included task constraints, but also environmental and organismic. I could enforce an organismic rule where no one is allowed to speak and to narrow the pitch to change the environmental constraint to start to build upon all aspects of the constraints-led model. When Chartal 2010 states environmental constraints refer to physical factors such as the surroundings of the learner's gravity and the information available in learning contexts such as the amount of light or level of noise in a gym or sports field. Nash 2010 also believes that the size of the playing area is seen to be the environmental constraint that can influence conditioned games. Leading on from the last clip, I changed the size of the pitch by making it smaller. There are still four goals and the same amount of players, but without the box in the middle. As you can see by this clip, they seem to have taken a step back as all the players are running into the space at the same time. Then the ball gets passed, the players all try to run out of the way to try to make space.
I did not imply any other constraint, but self-organisation seems to have kicked in and they were able to make passes and create space. If the constraint did not work and they were still running to the same place, I would have separated the pitch and half the players to stay on one side. By learning to continuously adapt in dynamic performance environments, the performer is challenged to find the best solution at that moment in time, rather than to rely on rehearsed action that is suited to different constraints. Importantly, the strategy of altering task constraints represents a more robust active route to changing behaviour than, for example, simply getting the learner to copy a demonstration or follow instructions. To summarise, when Chartel 2010 states that there is some evidence that coaches have intuitively tended to use the method of identifying and manipulating key constraints on learners. Regardless of this intuition, it is essential that practitioners understand the theoretical concepts that underlie the constraints-led approach. This will enable me to develop a model of the learner and of the learning process that will further enhance the practice. It is obvious that I did not fully understand why it was not working and what I needed to do to change and manipulate the learners in the correct way but, to, but after developing this presentation I have created much more understanding and knowledge of constraints and how to incorporate it into nonlinear pedagogy.